The views and opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of Access for Wayne, the Allen County Public Library, or any other supporting groups. If you'd like to produce a show, call us at 260-421-1250. When I first learned that I was conceived in rape, when I was 18, I felt totally alone. And it was years before I finally met somebody else. And I spoke at his church and he introduced me as his sister. Different rapist, same father in heaven. <laughs> and it was so great to be able to laugh like that. Every year in the United States, over 25,000 women become pregnant through rape. One third of these women choose to keep and raise their children, while still others choose adoption. Save the One protects, supports, and empowers such mothers and such children. And I remember standing here in the kitchen. I just found out that I had been the product of rape. My mom told me that she wanted to sit down and talk to me. She was trembling and, and was crying. She began to tell me that I was conceived in rape. Our culture tends to talk about life conceived in rape as a disgrace, a painful reminder, the rapist child. Our laws are less likely to protect a child conceived in rape, and often so are we. And I spent so much of my time trying to hide that part of my life, and now I realize that there's nothing to be ashamed about. I don't deserve death. My children deserve to be alive. I deserve to be alive. We are more than overcomers, and my mom and I have become our greatest advocates and supporters of each other. And I share it for the women who are like my mom. Just because we were conceived in rape, it doesn't mean that there is nothing beautiful in us and from us that can't be offered. If you're facing the pain of rape or of an abortion, if you're a mother or a child by rape or incest, you are not alone. There's strength in numbers and it is a huge witness when they can see a whole group of us Save the one. This is Patty Hunter of Patty's Page. Thank you for tuning in to my show. Patty's uh, Page TV show has been on the air for almost 11 years now, and we have very important guests. Today, my special guest is Rebecca Keesley, and she is pro life speaker an attorney at law, and president of Save the One. Welcome to my show, Rebecca. Thank you, Patty. I have a lot of questions, if you, if you don't mind. So last time we talked many months ago, uh, you were living where? Are you Same. still there? Hmm? Same place. You have moved, it's the same place. Yeah. Okay. Okay, what universities or colleges did you go to after graduating from high school? I went to Kane University in New Jersey mm -hmm. and then came back here for law school. I went to Wayne State University Law School. And what did in you major in? Uh, English major in undergrad with a writing emphasis. And I had a minor in political science and I took as many legal classes as I could. And I, I took acting one and two and I took oh. acting for television and I took public speaking classes because I thought that being a strong writer 
um, being comfortable up on my feet was going to help me to be a good lawyer. Yeah. But of course, I ended up using it to be a speaker. <laughs> well, yeah, pro-life speaker to, to, oh my goodness. So besides being an attorney, you have taken on another career. Well, you know, I am a family law attorney and I'm an international pro-life speaker. Yes, ma'am. And you're taking on another position being president. Uh, I'm, I'm the founder and president of Save the One. Yeah. That's the numeral one, not the word one. And we have a global network of over 1,000 who were conceived in rape like me and mothers who became pregnant by rape or incest or sex trafficking. Mm. And either they're raising their children, they are birth mothers, they miscarried, or they are post-abortive and regret aborting. And then we have hundreds in our carry to birth division. Mm. So those are people who were given a challenging prenatal diagnosis and told by doctors to abort. Oh. So we specialize in defending all of these so-called hard cases in the abortion debate through our personal stories. So these hard cases, what are they? They are rape? Rape, incest, um, fetal abnormalities. Mm -hmm. drug exposure in utero, anything like anything that would be considered to be a difficult case. Special needs. Is that, is that like... Um, Disabled children in the womb. Yeah. And Down syndrome too. Yes. Why, why are they aborting people who are not perfect? What, what gives? You, I don't understand. I'm trying. I've been trying all these years to try to understand. Are they trying to make a perfect uh, world? Yeah, I mean, it's prejudice. Yes, it's not right. So um, how many people do you have working with you again? Well, I mean, our, in our network, mm -hmm. we have, um, between all the different types of stories, we have thousands. But we have... Uh, a whole team of volunteers on our Spanish page who translate our stories for our blog in Spanish and send it out all over the world for publication. Um, besides the translators, we have editors on, uh, and we have translators for Portuguese, my stories in many, many different languages on my website, RebeccaKingling.com. Yeah. And then we have, um, people who are editors who run our social media pages. So we have volunteers who run our Spanish page and our Portuguese page and our, our page in English mm -hmm. and people who run our Twitter and our Instagram in English and in Spanish uh, and our YouTube channel. Wow. So yeah, we have, a, we have a great team of people and we have um, dozens of, pro-life speakers on our website who are available for speaking. What's the website called again? SaveTheOne.com. It's from That's the parents of the law sheet. Where the Good Shepherd leaves the 99 to save the one. Yes. And that one is very special. Mm -hmm. He said, oh. see that you do not despise any of these little ones, for I tell you they're angels in heaven. Always look upon the face of my father in heaven. And then at the end of the parable of the lost sheep, he explains that um, for in the same way, your father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish mm -hmm. and neither should we. So in context, in the parable of the lost sheep, he was talking about little ones who are despised, who are at risk of being killed. And he's not willing that any of them should die. Yes, I'm glad that. That is what our Lord has, you know, wanted us to do, to help our children, our, our neighbors, everybody. They're all important to him very much. So, Yeah, including... but unfortunately, there's a, a motto within the pro-life movement in the United States where the majority voice says that you save the 99 and you sacrifice the one. They'll say you save the 99 in exchange for the one and that it's only 1%. And so they're willing that the one should perish. No, that's not good. Where and hence, hence our name. That's where our name came from. 
Yes, I, I just wanted to know why they came up with this idea, 99% to sacrifice the 1%. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. still child sacrifice. That's it. It's, it's and, and if you, when all aren't protected, none are protected because they always use the rape exception to open the door for all abortions. Norma McCorvey Jane Roe was told by her lawyers to lie and say she was raped. Oh. And um, that case was originally brought on the lie of rape. We look um, in the United States, they first began legalizing abortion all across the South in cases of rape starting in 1967. Mm -hmm. And rape, the rape exception is what opened the door for all abortions. And we see this all over the world. And all a woman has to do is say rape, even if it's, um, only legal in cases of rape. You have, you know, tens of thousands of abortions in, in nations um, where there's only a rape exception, but everybody's doing it under the guise of rape. And all, you know, just wink, wink, say the secret password. You know, no proof, no trial, no nothing, no due process, and the child is sentenced to death. I don't understand why women nowadays would have abortions. I mean, in the old days, you know, before the 50s or whatever, when we were raised as a family unit, father, mother, children. Nowadays, it's only one parent. And if they don't want the baby, it's expend expendable. I don't understand what happened to our culture one extreme to the other. And the thing is that they'll say that we're antiquated, yeah. that you know you want to go back to the days of antiquity. Well, you know, the days of antiqu antiquity, um, I always think of child sacrifice. <laughs> you know, they're the ones who are antiquated. It, they, what they're doing is nothing new. Right. This is exactly what they did in the days of antiquity where they sacrificed children. I talked with someone on chat who said exactly what you said that um children sacrificing that's what they used to do in the past why not it's legal you know so we'll yeah where is so your the ones who are backwards and going back in time and there's evil in there completely that satan himself and so this battle will go on forever you know, this is nothing new. There will always be this battle. I'm just wondering if we'll be able to stop this baby killing before it's too late for most of us. Those who are Christian, they do have their hope in the Lord himself. That's why we're not going crazy or anything like that, like the people out there who do not believe in our God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Is that what you is that what you see? Uh, yeah. Of course. Mm -hmm. It's part of the fall of a society. Yeah, with God no longer in the uh, in the classes, and some of the churches are being closed down in California because of this pandemic. But I don't know. And this pandemic, do you have trouble? Communicating with others like you used to do when you went on lectures or the pro life speaking? Well, I mean, I've done some virtual events. Um, I've pulled back since the pandemic um, myself. Uh, you know, I just wasn't as active. I, I just think it was all like really overwhelming to me. Yeah. And, you know, my speaking was all canceled last spring. And then I did some travels in the fall. And I have an event coming up in Florida in a couple of weeks. Um, my event in California was postponed until the fall now, but, um, you know, and just a little bit of virtual events, but yeah, it's not the same. Yeah. And I did go to DC for the March for life. I mean, what normally would have been the March for life, but, you know, engaged in some activities, but obviously it wasn't the same and, you know, not even a, a you know, 1% of the scale of what it normally is. Um, and it was disappointing that they decided not to do anything for the march. Mm. 
um, we're going to see a lot of bad stuff coming this year That's in it. Congress. You know, since the Democrats control um, both houses, uh, you know, the, the House and the Senate, both chambers, um, as well as the presidency, we, we will see a lot of bad stuff coming down. I mean, we already are. Already change laws and everything. Yeah. So um, this is not the time to let up. And so I'm trying to do more, to post more. Um, no, but obviously it's not the same. We have to use social media. And then it's frustrating that a lot of conservatives are leaving traditional social media because they feel like, you know, they're not being treated fairly. But, you know, Jesus went to the home of the sinners and tax collectors. He said, because, you know, it's the sick who need a doctor. And we're supposed to be salt and light to the world. But now we're going to go hide. We're going to go off to our own um private social media platforms and be away from the people in the middle who really need to hear it like that's really disappointing me to me because i think that we need to stay on facebook and twitter and continue to be a light as best we can okay. and i also i'm frustrated with a lot of people who don't know how to effectively communicate mm -hmm. because they're they're more interested in sort of like spanking people you know, and chastising them instead of like trying to win hearts. Like they try to win arguments, but they're not trying to win hearts. And I also notice people are more involved trying to save the animals instead of saving the babies. Yeah, but I'm talking about people who want to save babies. Yeah. A lot of them need to learn to be more effective because they're not they're not winning hearts yeah. with their approach. And you know, it's really stories that pierce the heart and ways in which arguments cannot. That's why our stories are so important. Our stories from Save the One are so important because they are effective in changing hearts and minds. I see it all the time. What but if you, you if all you do is argue with people, you're, you're not gonna win people over. We need um, a lot of people to gather together like you do this around the world to talk about what happened to them as being a product of rape. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I, I speak globally um, all over North America, Europe, Latin America. What is your story? That you... um, I was conceived in rape. My birth mother was abducted at knife point by a serial rapist. And she went to two illegal abortions and I was almost killed. But she backed out because of fear for her own safety and because it was illegal. But she was happy to meet me when I was 19, but absolutely told me that if abortion had been legal, she would have aborted me and that it should have been her right. And then six years later, she changed her mind about abortion. And now decades later, we're both so thankful that we were both protected. Yes. That we, we were both spared from the horror of abortion. Your mom, was she Christian? Um, she's still alive. My birth mother's still alive. Uh, and she um, expresses a belief in God. Mm -hmm. uh, she says she doesn't go to church because of her allergies to perfume. Mm -hmm. you know, she has severe allergies. Oh. Uh, well, but, um, in churches, there are also rooms to the side if they cannot be with the whole congregation, you should say that to her. Yeah, it's you know it's um it's a difficult topic because she'll. It's hard to tell where she stands because she holds it close. A lot of people, the older people, are basically like that, aren't they? Or is it, is it so. Yeah. Yeah. so um. When did you find out that you were conceived in a rape? Were you older or a child? I learned how I was conceived when I was 18. 18? I was 18 when I learned. And then 19 when I met her and learned the horrible details. So she gave you up for adoption. Mm -hmm. How old was she when she was uh, raped? 
31 when I was born to like 30, just before her 31st birthday. Do you have any siblings? Or? I do. I have a half brother and a half sister. She has no relationship with them today. They're older than me. They were 11 and 13 when I was born. And I'm the only one that she has a relationship with her. I'm, I'm the one who honors her. I'm sorry. And then I met my, um, through Ancestry DNA, I found who the rapist is. And he's still alive. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a half brother through my biological father who is two months older than me. So his mother, to whom the rapist is still married, uh, his mother um, was two months pregnant mm -hmm. when the rapist, you know, raped my mom. Um, I have not met the rapist. I have met my half brother. I adore him. We have a fabulous relationship together. He told me that his father's dangerous and that he doesn't recommend meeting him. And if I did, he said it should be in public and I should have a man with me because he said that he's got a terrible temper. Yeah. Um, I had a half sister, yeah. but she died about 10 years before I found the identity of my biological father. She died in a horrible car crash yeah. and she never, she never married, never had children. So I'm my, you know, my half brother's like only family now really so um do you have any kids i do good i have uh three biological daughters mm -hmm. and i had three adopted children good. um a baby girl cassie who died at 33 days old 20 years ago okay. and my sons caleb and kyler mm -hmm. They died last summer, July 29th, at 18 and 20. Oh, my God. Oh, we love you, girl. I wish I could give you a big hug. I'm sorry. Okay. I've been talking about them this season. I For my speeches, I, I did a tribute to all of my adopted children. Oh, my son Caleb's birthday is February 15th. Oh, yeah. It was a horrible tragedy. They um were experimenting and got a hold of some fake um some fake Percocet. And the fake Percocet pills that were not laced yeah. because um there was zero Percocet in them. They were 100% fentanyl, which is deadly. Um, did they catch the people who did that? There's been an arrest, and uh, it's it will be going to trial. If you need any help from me, let me know, okay? Thank you. Their uncle, their, their birth mother's youngest brother died a month after them, same thing. And then their birth mother just died two weeks ago. They had a really tough family history. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. your family. But their great grandparents yeah. on their biological side, on their birth mother's side, their great grandparents were pro life activists. And that's why their birth mother chose life. She was 16 when Caleb was born and 18 when Kyla was born, and she was doing heroin throughout the pregnancy. Oh. Um, but she did not choose abortion. And I'm really grateful that they got to live and that I got to be their mom. My son wrote out his story and he said, you know, everybody deserves a chance at life. Yes, everybody does. No one. He out when he was 11 years old and, you know, they, they had a chance at life. and. He talked about what a great life he had shortly before he died. He told me it's so many good memories and had a great childhood. You know, people should realize that human beings are separate from the mother in the womb. Different humans, different souls, male or female. They have the right to live. And I have a strong face, so I, I know where my boys are. They both 
you know, really repented um, shortly before they died. And they, they, Caleb wrote out a three page testimony yeah. and um, Kyla wrote out, you know, 17 point goals for his life. And they both, you know, wanted to be free from addiction. And, um, you know, they, they placed their trust in Christ and I, I know where they are. Yeah. And I tell my daughters, this is when faith counts. Um, it makes, you stronger, makes you strong. Mm -hmm. Makes you one with the Lord himself. And Jesus said that, you know, no one can snatch them yes. from me. You know, they were, when they first believed, they were marked with a seal of the Holy Spirit as a deposit on their inheritance. And I know that he, um, he is, you know, the good father to the prodigal son. He is indeed. And he said that, he said, if you being sinful, you know, as parents, if you know how to give good gifts, you know, how much more so will your heavenly father lavish good gifts? And I know that he's so much better than I am. And I know how I would welcome them. So I know that the father welcomed them. No matter how young or how old kids are, they are loved and very, and very important because it's God's gift to us. And I'm glad I'm have... grateful. I'm grateful for the time I have. Yes. We love you, girl. Thank you. I'd like to thank you. Thank Coming you. Into my life, because my late aunt was an abortionist. And I've known some people who had abortion through it. And that's why I'm gung ho with the pro life to save babies that should not have been killed. And rejoice for the babies who are saved from being aborted or who are, have been aborted but they still live and they are being saved at that time. So God bless you, girl. Thank you. You're a good friend. Appreciate it. We love you. Thank you. Love you all. <laughs> Pro-life people are just, you know, the best people on earth, really. They're good. good. Compassionate. Selfless, selfless caring. Yeah. That's the way we should be as human beings. So this is Patty Hunter, Patty Page. Thank you, Rebecca Keesling, for coming on to my show. We love you. We want you on again. So uh, this is Patty's Page, Patty Hunter. See you next week. God's us always for the rest of all our